Good morning. Uh, I'm Amitesh Adam. I'm from, uh, I belong to TFR uh, only uh, from uh, Mumbai campus. I'm a group leader there and uh, my group works on uh, energy metabolism, particularly in uh, microbial context. Um, so a little bit of uh, uh, introduction about myself uh, and uh, one of the motivation for that is to tell you how I ventured into bioenergetics. So I was doing my PhD with uh, Professor Rajesh Gokhale at uh, Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology at uh, Delhi. Um, I and Rajesh both are uh, academically trained in chemistry and both were interested in doing research in uh, biology. We had, uh, at least at that time, we had no interest in looking into the energy metabolism. We were primarily interested in uh, trying to figure out uh, the physiological role of a redox active molecule that we had discovered from microchem tuberculosis. We call that molecule uh, polyketide quinone because the origin of that molecule is from these polyketide synthases. While trying to figure out what the role of that molecule is, we got into the uh, energetics of rheumacobacteria. And from there, things started. So my start in the field of uh, energetics was quite unintentional. But then uh, from there, I intentionally chose to go to Professor Bernard Paulson's lab at University of California, San Diego, to do my postdoc. And there, I actually wanted to do a lot more in the field of bacterial uh, energetics. Um, Bernard is primarily known for uh, systems biology, quantitative systems biology, what the school is about. And, uh, and of course, uh, along with that, all sorts of uh, computational uh, uh, tools and techniques he uh, uses. I was one of the rare species in his group who was primarily doing experiments. And that was around the time when I started to understand what the uses of uh, this quantitative systems biology is in understanding the nuances of uh, biology understanding the fundamentals of biology and how much deeper insight it can provide. And probably that's the reason why Shashi wanted me to be here to talk more about uh, uh, this field from a beneficiary's point of view. So what I'm gonna tell you about is how uses of quantitative systems biology has helped my own work, has helped my science. And hopefully that will uh, uh, motivate some of the uh, younger colleagues to venture more into this area and uh, maybe help my research, help uh, research in this field in general. Um, I was talking to Rituraj from IIT Madras uh, yesterday and he mentioned that the crowd is quite varied and which is something I was expecting also. So, and this morning uh, my group members only, so I, two of my group members are here. So if during my talk there is something not very clear, um, get hold of them. Anjali sitting there, Stuti is there. Uh, talk to them. Uh, they will tell you exactly what I am going to say, if not more. So uh, take advantage of their presence. Um, so they warn me that uh, I have to start from start. So that's what I'm trying to do over here. And uh, fortunately, I was prepared for that. So while I was preparing for this lecture, I corresponded with uh, Drew Berry uh, from the High Institute. And he's uh, one of the most amazing uh, biomedical animator that I have <laughs> seen. And I requested him, can I use one of his uh, animation for uh, this lecture? And he kindly agreed to it. So given this lecture is being recorded, this is totally fine because I have taken the permission for this uh, animation to be used for this purpose. Um, so let's start from here. This will give you a sense of uh, what I'm gonna talk about because uh, within the entire vast field of energetics, I'm primarily gonna focus on electron transport system. So this one is about uh, mitochondrial electron transport system. So let's take uh, some, about three, four minutes going, th going through this uh, video, and then I'll continue from there. The center of activity that brings your cells to life is found inside the... The inner mitochondrial membrane is coated with enzymes that catalyze the chemical reactions of respiration, working in sequence to generate the electron transport chain. The first step in the electron transport chain is performed by enzyme complex one. 
Complex one receives electrons from coenzyme NADH, a substrate produced by the citric acid cycle. The catalytic mechanism of enzyme complex one connects two different kinds of reaction. Coenzyme NADH is oxidized at one end of the enzyme, releasing two electrons that hop through the interior to coenzyme Q, which is reduced. <laughs> Traveling amongst membrane lipids, coenzyme Q carries electrons to the next step in the electron transport chain. The movement of charged electrons through complex one makes it bend in shape, transmitting energy for pumping four protons across the membrane. The second step of the electron transport chain is performed by enzyme complex three. The mechanism of complex three separates electrons from coenzyme Q, passing one electron to cytochrome C, which is reduced. A complete reaction cycle of enzyme complex three transports four protons across the membrane. Traveling within the intermembrane space, reduced cytochrome C carries the electron to the final step in the electron transport chain. The destination for electron transport is a molecule of oxygen held inside enzyme complex four. Reduced cytochrome C delivers electrons that transfer to the reaction center of enzyme complex four. A molecule of oxygen from the air you breathe is captured, split, and reduced. The separated oxygen atoms accept electrons and pick up protons, creating two molecules of water. The substrate providing electrons to enzyme complex one is coenzyme NADH, a product of the citric acid cycle. A second supply of electrons for the electron transport chain is from step six of the citric acid cycle performed by enzyme complex two. Enzyme complex two catalyzes oxidation of succinate releasing two electrons, which hop through the enzyme to coenzyme Q, which is reduced. Traveling through the membrane, coenzyme Q carries the electron to enzyme complex three of the electron transport chain. So uh, there were two motivations behind uh, showing this video. Um, one, of course, the is center of activity that brings your cells to life. Yeah. One, of course, is to uh, give you, uh, especially the non-biology audience, a uh, feel for what I'm going to talk about. And uh, if you haven't uh, uh, understood uh, uh, the details of uh, the animation, uh, no worries. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, each and every step of that in detail in today's and tomorrow's uh, uh, talk. And the second thing is that I'm a big fan of, uh, in general, Drew Berry's work, and especially this animation, because uh, a lot of things that you saw in the video were, are like scientific, scientifically most accurate. Nowhere I have seen anyone showing coenzyme Q the way they have shown. And then I actually followed back whether the coenzyme Q really lies like that in the membrane. And that was true, and I was so, so, so fascinated. So I 
couldn't uh, resist my temptation to show this animation to all of you. So the animation that you saw, that was for a mitochondrial electron transport system. While that itself is quite fascinating, the way uh, redox chemistry works at the membrane to generate proton motive force, and then that force is utilized for uh, uh, pumping the proton in the cell through ATP synthesis for the production of ATP. And you know how uh, critical and crucial that ATP supply is for the life in general. Things get even more uh, uh, interesting in bacteria. In bacteria, um, many of those enzymes are present in, um, I don't know whether calling them redundant is the right way or not, probably not, but there are multiples of uh, similar kind of enzymes present. So this is a very, uh, this uh, piece is from a very old uh, uh, review article where they have shown how many different dehydrogenases and oxidases exist in bacterial system. And these dehydrogenases can take electron from various different kinds of substrate and oxidases can then finally donate those electrons to various different kind of electron acceptors. And they can function in various combinations. And that's why the route of electron flow through bacterial electron transport system becomes enormous. And in this particular review, uh, they have yet not introduced another factor that uh, uh, makes this enormity even larger, and that's something called isoprenoid quinones. And these isoprenoid, the, this uh, ubiquinone uh, that I was talking to you about the previous, uh, just a uh, couple of seconds ago, those are the isoprenoid quinones, and those are the mobile electron carrier present in uh, the membrane. Those uh, isoprenoid quinones themselves are quite diverse. There are uh, ubiquinone, neptoquinone, and several others. And again, they can uh, function uh, in combination with various different uh, uh, dehydrogenases and oxidases. So basically the flow of electron through bacterial electron transport system becomes very, very, very diverse. So before jumping into that, let's talk briefly about how all these things started. How did we reach that enormity in the electron transport system? Uh, and uh, my lab is quite interested in uh, doing uh, laboratory evolution. It's not exactly the evolution evolution, but uh, uh, it's like a simulation of evolution in the lab. So in general, we are interested in evolution. So majority of my talk, majority of my work start with a hinge of evolution. So that's what I'm gonna do over here. Um, I have very carefully written theory for the origin of uh, Arabic uh, ETS. The reason is that uh, till now there's no clarity on exactly how it has evolved. There are lots of theories out there. One of the theory I have picked because uh, uh, it looks quite logical to me, and there are quite uh, quite a bit of evidences to support it. So it goes like uh, uh, in primitive Earth, uh, the energetics was primarily fermentative, resulting in secretion of lots of organic acids. At the same time, the extracellular events were also causing acidification of the uh, milieu, and that acidification was potentially putting a acid stress and acid stress on the cells, and. Uh, to cope up with that uh, uh, acid stress, there was this uh, emergence of ATPases. They actually use ATP for pumping out proton to maintain the pH homeostasis. Um, this is not very crazy, because even in current uh, environment, there are lots of microbes, especially the anaerobes. They use uh, these ATPases to maintain their membrane potential. They get their energy supply from glycolysis, fermentation, but then these ATPases are used for their membrane potential uh, maintenance. And I'll talk to you about why it is critical for them to maintain that membrane potential, uh, probably towards the later talk, later part of today's talk only or tomorrow. So that's believed, uh, uh, that's how this ATPases came. But as you can see that these ATPases are using ATP. And ATP is a very, very uh, crucial metabolite for the cells. They want to conserve it. And it is believed that uh, it was the ATP conservation of stress that led to emergence of a different enzyme or enzyme complex, which is in modern world known as NADH dehydrogenase. And they actually uses the, uh, this reduction chemistry over here, uh, oxidation of NADH to NAD plus uh, to pump out proton. So that's how this happened. Later on, uh, um, during this era, there were lots of geochemical changes happening on Earth, especially photosynthetic activity was becoming quite a norm in the life. And uh, oxygen, unlike what we believe, is a very toxic molecule. 
um, we ourselves can only sustain a certain uh, uh, range of oxygen. If it goes beyond that, it will be lethal to us also. And just imagine the situation of uh, organisms that were living in anoxic uh, earth. They were just not exposed to oxygen. They had no sense of what this uh, uh, molecule is. So they were just not prepared for it. So when uh, oxygen appeared on earth, there were lots of uh, adaptive changes in uh, uh, the, their physiology. Uh, I'll talk about uh, one of them in detail uh, uh, tomorrow, but uh, one among them was the emergence of these oxidases. So these oxidases were primarily utilized for uh, mitigating the toxicity of oxygen. So they were just able, they were able to reduce oxygen to water, and this was also allowing them to pump proton. Now, if you look at uh, this particular structure here, we have everything to create electron transport system. I have done nothing but just straighten this thing over here. Now you have entry point for electron, you have exit point for electron, and the cells were only required to reverse direction of a proton through these uh, ATPases, and they are now more commonly known as ATP synthases. So now electron enters from here, results in generation of these proton motive force, and then these protons are then taken in for the production of the ATP. So this is one of the theory for the origin and evolution of electron transport system. Um, as is the nature of evolution, uh, doesn't stop anywhere. Um, so does the does the pump, the proton pump, generating ATP, they, they can run both ways? Yes. Even in the current uh, world, it's known that depending upon cell's requirement and depending upon uh, what the proton motive force is, they can change the direction. I forgot to mention that. Uh, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, as and when uh, needed. Uh, if there is anything not clear, I'll be happy to explain more on that. So that. So what I was saying is that uh, uh, the nature of evolution is not to stop anywhere. So that's what happened for electron transport system also. Um, there are lots of different uh, routes for the flow of electron uh, in modern world. So electron transport system has got quite diverse. And this diversity reflects in um, the outcome, which is the proton motive force generation. Here, what I've shown is a, a very, very simplistic representation of uh, Escherichia coli's uh, uh, electron transport system. Evolution is quite poor. Are you able to see things labeled over here? Probably no. No, right? Okay, I'll, I'll try reading what that is. So, there are two of these NADH dehydrogenases, uh, NDH1 and NDH2. I have intensely uh, changed their or shown them in different sizes because NDH1 is a giant enzyme complex compared to that NDH2 is a smaller enzyme complex. Then there are several cytochrome oxidases. SIO is the cytochrome BO3 oxidase and CBD is the cytochrome BD oxidase. There are two of cytochrome BD oxidases in, in Shirichia coli. Both function almost similarly. That's why I have clubbed them together. Now, Electron can either enter through NDH1 or NDH2, and then this electron can go to cytochrome BD oxidases or cytochrome BO3 oxidases. Depending upon what route it takes, it can generate different proton motive force. Basically, it can pump different amount of proton. So if electron is passing through NDH2 and cytochrome BD, BD oxidase, then there will be one proton pumped for uh, every NADH. And similarly, uh, two proton, three proton, and four proton. So there are different different uh, uh, ETS variants that can be created. Uh, this is exactly what I wanted to do in uh, Paulson's lab at uh, UCSD. And we wanted to look into what are the implication of this diversity, and uh, what are the uh, systems biology of uh, electron transport system, and can we understand uh, what are the uh, benefits of these alternate routes in bacterial physiology. So I will just take uh, a minute to explain uh, what I was talking about to this adaptive laboratory evolution. Um, so, and I have, I have kind of modified the statement of uh, Dobzhensky, no way to disregard him, rather to bring that, bring more context in the field of microbiology. So classically in the field of microbiology or in general in biology, what we do is that we create some sort of perturbation, and we immediately start looking into the uh, phenotypic manifestation of that change, be it uh, genetic perturbation or some environmental perturbation. 
but that only tells us about the proximal impact of that change. So in Paulson's group and uh, many other uh, group, uh, there's this concept which is becoming quite a norm that is adaptive laboratory evolution, where what is done is that you first create that perturbation and then allow that system enough time to deal with that changed uh, environment, uh, intracellular or extracellular. And then you look for the stable distal impact of that perturbation. So that's what is done using uh, these adaptive laboratory evolution experiments. So using the understanding of uh, ETS variants that I showed a slide before, um, we wanted to actually create these variants. We wanted that uh, to force the flow of electron through one particular route out of the four possible routes in uh, HHA coli. And it was quite simple because we exactly knew what are the enzyme complexes involved in various routes and what are the genes responsible for the uh, production of those enzyme complexes. So what we have done over here is that we have just taken a very simple genetic engineering approach where we have deleted certain combination of uh, genes to be able to create strains that will be able to pump a defined number of proton uh, per electron. So these are the variants. And as I was mentioning to you that uh, we created these variants and then we evolved them so that we have these evolved variants over here. And these evolved variants are the one which are the optimized system uh, using those different uh, ETS variants. Vitesh, I have a quick question. Um, so this is simply to knock out everything that there is. But do you also have quantitative control on how many go in and can you uh, put some numbers onto this in terms of how many... If you're many... talking about can we actually calculate the number or of protons? Just, yeah, just estimate or something. Yeah, so estimate is based on tons of work that's been done in past where we exactly know how many protons can be pumped by various of these enzyme complexes. So we know that. No, so I guess my question is, are you measuring the membrane potential? Not so, really. Yeah. Uh, we, would, we would want to, we would love to, but as I was telling you that uh, Paulson's lab was primarily a, a computational lab. Um, I, he provided me everything that I wanted for my experiments, but not really everything. So I wanted to do that, but uh, I couldn't. But uh, yeah, that's the one thing that uh, we may want to try. Now in my lab uh, also, we are following these things. We can do that. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap sure, my head sure. around this sure, and sure. understand exactly what you're doing. So you are retaining only the NADH transporters? I'm only retaining certain combination of NADH dehydrogenases and oxidases. So electron will be able to flow from dehydrogenases to oxidases, but they are only allowed to take one out of the possible four routes. Okay. So if I just quickly take you to this slide over here, if I want them to take this route, that is NDS2 to CBD, I'm gonna delete this and this. That's precisely what I'm doing. Okay, so that, and uh, this one is nothing but uh, the evolution trajectory that we get. Um, <clears throat> on the y-axis, you have growth rate, and on the x-axis, the number of generations. So number of generation is telling you about uh, uh, the length of evolution experiments, and uh, the growth rate is telling you the phenotypic uh, uh, improvement in those strains. Um, there can be various other uh, factors or various other parameters that can be plotted on y-axis depending upon what your uh, interest in those evolution experiments are. We were primarily interested in uh, increasing their growth rate, so that's what you see over here. Uh, and these are the evolution trajectories, and we do uh, most of these evolution experiments with the at least four independent uh, uh, lineages so that uh, we can uh, figure out what are the uh, actual causal uh, um, mechanisms for the improvement in those phenotypes. But those, these plots doesn't mean a lot. What will uh, uh, make sense? Mitesh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, just a question about the evolution experiment. So it's just when you say evolution, you mean just massaging or just yeah, yeah. culturing? Um, we call it evolution, that's why I started with saying that we call it evolution in a very fancy way, but it is actually optimization. It's an optimization okay. of their growth rate. Okay, and right, so and in, in these experiments, which, so you don't use any sort of wild type controls sort of situation? Yes, we do, we do. Okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, and on this plot, I'm gonna talk about that. So 
was that the only question that you have? I'm just trying to, because I don't have my glasses and labels, I couldn't see it. Uh, was there any wild type? Does it remain the same over generations? And that's what I wanted. To so um, Paulson's lab has been doing these evolution experiments for now, I think more than a decade or so, uh, probably two decades. So we have evolved the wild type many times, and we exactly know what will happen to wild type strains when they evolve. And uh, that is actually one of the reference, one of the control, if you say, uh, for all our evolution experiments. No, no, it's not there. I'll show that plot uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm also gonna talk about another evolution experiment and there I'll actually show you the wild type plot. Yes. So when you knocked out um, these pairs of enzymes, over the evolution, what's happening is, are, are some enzymes coming back or some mutation happening? What's That's precisely what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. just give me maybe five minutes. And that will be clear. Mitesh, I have a even simpler. Yes. What exactly is being done here? Right? What do you mean by evolution or optimization? So you have a this culture. Is, you what, have these what mutants. What we are doing is exactly this. You have these mutants, these... and then you're just doing serial transfer. Yes. That's all. That's all. And what do you mean by optimization, though? Uh, are optimization, you... optimization in the sense that we are doing the passage. So we are using the same environment, same temperature, same, same aeration, same media type. And within that uh, same environment, we are passing it for as many generations they take to attain the maximum growth rate. So basically, till the stage where the growth rate improvement flattens. So the idea here is to bring them to the maximum growth capacity that they can achieve. So it's obvious that if you just do serial dilution, it will increase or am I missing? Or there's no, there's no selection, there's no competition. The selection over here, selection pressure over here. Oh, you're saying it's simply rate. because of the growth. Ah. Yes, that's what I that's what I was telling you. That uh, that readout can be other things also. That can be like in some of the cases uh, people do uh, AMR kind of work, antimicrobial resistance. So there, the selection pressure is to tolerate those antibiotics. So there can be different readouts, but uh, the readout we were interested in was the growth rate, and that was exactly for what you were talking about because we wanted to see whether these variants will be able to reach wild type level of growth rate. So that was the, so and that's the evolution. And the evolution, when I say over here, is nothing but just passaging those uh, uh, strains in that given environment. I, uh, just, as a, just as a control, if you knock all the genes out, do you, do you get basically E. coli that don't grow at all? Like all of these genes that you mentioned in this table, yeah, yeah, yeah. not the union of them out, do you not get, get growth anymore? So basically then in that situation, uh, you will make these strains anaerobic. So they should still grow and they will still grow. It's just that their growth rate will be extremely slow and uh, they will behave like an anaerobic microbe. They still have uh, glycolysis and fermentation to meet their ATP supply, not to the extent that ETS can, they will be, and again, I mentioned that uh, they have uh, ATP synthesis that can reverse direction for the maintenance of uh, proton molecules. We actually wanted to create, so we wanted to create this strain called NETS, which we wanted to, this was the acronym for no ETS. Um, somehow these cells were resisting hard to get rid of all those enzyme complexes. So we tried that for about six months and so we were not able I don't know what exactly was the reason, but we were not able to create that strain. But in principle, theoretically, that's possible. Yes. Um, so um, it took several hundred generations yes. uh, for it to for the growth rate to increase. Um, now. Um, so the course of, I mean, through the course of that evolution, um, should one think that there are mutations in some other genes that are causing an adaptation to this particular, or, or this particular sets of knockouts that you've, you've done? Yeah. Or uh, is there some, some uh, physiological um, uh, sort of adjustment which is happening on a very slow time scale uh, which is simply changing the expression levels of some things and so on. What exactly, uh, how, how is one to think of this evolution that is taking place? So that question is somewhat related to what was asked just now. And I'll come to that in a few minutes, but then uh, given that question is coming regularly, I should uh, address that now. 
So in majority of our relation experiment, the improvement is because of mutations. And uh, uh, your second uh, logic is also not uh, entirely uh, not true, because if you keep on passaging a strain in a given environment, transiently they improve their growth. So this is something that we see on a regular basis in our lab. So you take stock out from uh, uh, cryostock, you grow them, and in the second or third passage, you'll see that they are growing better. So there is some bit of physiological adjustment also to improve the growth rate, but the stable impact that we see or the stable phenotype that we see are mostly uh, attained due to some sort of beneficial mutation. So in these four cases, over the course of uh, generations, you say that the growth rate has optimized to a higher value than what you start with. Correct. But in the wild type, what was this kind of an experiment performed for the wild type strain as it is? And was the growth rate there, the optimized growth rate, more than the optimized growth rate here or less okay. than the other? So I'm glad that you asked this question here and the slide is exactly about that. So. Yes, in wild type, uh, also growth rate improvement happens. And uh, typically, uh, SHHA coli wild type, the strain that we use, uh, K12 MV1655, that uh, grows uh, with a growth rate of about uh, 0.75 to 0.8 per hour in uh, M9 media uh, with the glucose as carbon source. Of course, if you change the carbon source, if you change the media, their growth rate will differ. But in this particular uh, media that we are using in all these evolution experiments, their, uh, the wild type's growth rate is about uh, 0.75 per hour. And uh, we have done the evolution of the wild type, and they attain a growth rate of about 0.95 to 1 per hour after uh, uh, several hundred generations of evolution. And we exactly know what our mutations are uh, acquired. And there are these uh, RNA polymerases mutation, and then uh, there is this uh, PIRI RPH mutation for HNSTDK. There are several other mutations that actually improve the growth rate of wild type. And uh, what you see over here, uh, this line over here is to actually mark the boundary of wild type. So wild type will start somewhere here and it will go all the way till here. So one of the thing, uh, I, I was planning to come to that uh, after talking about this plot, but since uh, that question is here, uh, this arrow is actually marking that, that the variants that we have created, though they have improved their growth rate, they have not actually acquired the maximum possible growth rate for wild type E. coli in this media. So we believe that having those four routes provide them some sort of physical, physiological advantage over having one of the, any one of the possible routes. So there are two takeaways. One that when you kind of mutate the wild type strain, when you remove one of these uh, yep. pathways, uh, there is a fall in the growth rate. And yes. the second takeaway that irrespective of the mutation or no mutation to begin with, if you keep, uh, uh, if you make them evolve, they will eventually attain a higher optimal growth rate. Correct, than because that's, that's the phenotypic readout we are interested in. So we are actually biased to pick the strains that have higher growth rate. And the idea is for us to understand what will be those genetic changes that will enable higher growth rate in the background that we are studying. Is that clear? Oh, thank you. I have a question. So if I get it correctly, there were two things. One is the wild type, and one is where you did the mutations and saw a higher growth rate. OK? Is that? Uh, There's one wild type. There's a wild type, and there was the mutations performed where you saw a higher growth rate. Uh, let me. Uh, okay. So we have wild type strains, OK? We have these wild-type strains, okay? They grow with a growth rate of over 0.75 per hour in, uh, in the M9 member media, okay? And then we have uh, deleted uh, the genes that mentioned over here. Uh, first, we have deleted this IOB, and then in the background of IOB deleted strain, we have deleted NOOB to generate the variant that can pump one proton. So that's ETS1H. The growth rate of this strain is less than wild-type. Okay. And similarly, the growth rate of these variants, all these variants are less than wild-type. Okay. Before evolution. After evolution, they have improved their growth rate, although what I was just saying, that they have still not been able to reach the maximum growth rate of uh, uh, evolved wild type, but their growth rate has improved. 
Okay, so now my question was that was a rescue experiment performed as in after the evolutions, the hypothesis that you had that probably protein A or protein B or any agent, a particular gene, which was necessary, which actually caused the evolution. So was a rescue experiment performed to understand that without the presence of that agent? Five minutes. Yeah. Sure. We've done that, yes. And that's something uh, we cannot uh, not do and have uh, work published. Reviewers will kill us. So, um, I've already talked about this uh, in response to the question. So, uh, uh, what was interesting to see over here is that despite uh, differences in their starting growth rate, all of these strains were able to attain similar maximal growth rate. So, that's that. Um, what we then wanted to see, and this, this is exactly in response to what you were also interested in, to figure out what are enabling them to uh, grow better. As mentioned, for uh, all these dehydrogen oxidases, there are alternate uh, enzymes available. Like uh, when we delete this uh, type one NAD dehydrogenase, is it upregulation of type two that is enabling, that is allowing them to attain a higher growth rate? So we wanted to understand this, that whether the alternate enzymes are the one responsible for this. So for that, uh, we did a very simple experiment done in biology, that is RNA sequencing. So for non-biology audience, this is nothing but uh, we are trying to understand the expression level of different uh, uh, genes. Earlier, this was done using qPCR, and I think uh, during COVID time, most of you have heard of this uh, qPCR technology. So just uh, assume this as a high throughput way of qPCR. So we are looking into the expression level of these genes. Uh, what was interesting is that uh, there was no clear trend in the expression of the alternate enzymes. Although what was very interesting to see is uh, over here in ETS4H, so in ETS4H, when we were looking at the NOV expression, the unevolved strain was having a very low expression of this NOV, which is the NADS dehydrogenase that is present in that particular strain. After evolution, they were able to upregulate the expression of it. So that itself was quite interesting that what is blocking the increase in expression of that particular gene in the unevolved strain and what is happening during, during evolution to then release that pressure and allow them to reach a higher growth rate using the alternate enzyme. So that's exactly the mutational uh, changes uh, that we're gonna talk about. In fact, uh, if I'm not making that clear, get hold of Stuti, she had just published that work and she'll probably be glad to tell you in as detailed manner as possible about that uh, mechanism of that mutation and how that allows them. So again, uh, now this is the slide that uh, I wanted to uh, bring here as the beneficiary of quantitative systems biology. While expression profiling was not giving us a very clear idea on what is happening to these strains, how are these strains evolving, uh, I took help of uh, my colleagues in Paulson's lab, uh, Dr. Lawrence Yang, he now has a lab at Quincy University. He is a, he's also leading a group. Uh, and again, an amazing, amazing uh, uh, systems biology person and uh, so he helped me with this. And uh, what we did over here is that, uh, so he's, uh, this work was started with Lawrence Yang and then uh, uh, another uh, uh, lab member in Paulson's group, uh, Arjun uh, then uh, later took on uh, this thing. So what you are seeing over here is the genome scale model of uh, Echerichia coli being used. I guess uh, in one of the lecture, this genome scale model has been explained. So thanks to uh, that speaker. I'll probably skip the details, but what we have done over here is that we have taken one of the genome scale model of E. coli that is fold me. That this model has been generated by K. Chen, uh, again in Paulson's lab. And this model is uh, quite an accurate model uh, to predict uh, phenotypic outcomes of uh, Chirichia coli because it also takes in account the protein folding network of uh, E. coli. And uh, this model has been constrained using uh, metabolite exchange rates, growth rate, and RNA sequencing data. And we are trying to see how evolved strains are changing the flux through various uh, reactions of central carbon metabolism. So in case of ETS 1H and 2H, we didn't see any major change in it. But in case of ETS 3H and 4H, there was something very interesting happening that cells were moving away from uh, EMP pathway of glycolysis to ED pathway of glycolysis. Please bear with me with these jargons for today. Tomorrow I'm gonna talk in length about these EMP pathway and ED pathways and what does that, what does that mean? So what is happening is that this 3H and 4H, 
are using the components of electron transport system, which are relatively larger in size. So the cost of proteome is higher in these trains. So these trains have uh, more proteomic resources being used in their ETS. So now they're trying to mitigate uh, uh, that costly proteome by moving from EMP pathway to ED pathway. And I'm promising that I will make it clear tomorrow when I'm gonna talk about uh, this, uh, these two routes of glycolysis in length. So what is happening is that cells are uh, trying to optimize the proteomic cost over here. And these kind of information, um, at least I as an experimentalist would have never been able to fetch if systems biology or the genome, uh, genome scale models was not there for me to use. Sure. A question. Uh, so uh, just to make sure I understand correctly. So you have these uh, QPCR measurements of uh, um, RNA levels together yeah, with we have done the rate. RNA sequencing, yes. And then this is essentially a computational model that tells you fluxes that are compatible yeah. with these measures. How is this validated? So these models are actually constrained with actual experimental data. These models are constrained using a metabolite exchange rate. So we have done metabolite exchange rate, uh, metabolite uh, estimation. We have done the glucose, uh, lactate, succinate, fumarate, ethanol, and several other metabolites quantitation. So those quantitative, quantitative data has gone in the model to constrain it. Um, we know the experimental growth rate of these trains that has gone into the model. And of course, the RNA sequencing uh, data that I was telling you. So these models are actually constrained using uh, experimental data. These are not I only- guess, I guess my concern is like, for example, these RNA measurements have an error. So this error will reflect on uh, these fluxes. Yes. So is there some prediction of the model that can be, you know, that is not put in the model, correct, then correct. it would independently test and it's so your, to get your, a sense your of concern our is, Your concern is very valid mm -hmm. and uh, I cannot 100% rule that out, that can be, but that's why I was telling you that whenever we do these kind of laboratory evolution experiment and we try to rationalize the outcome, we rely a minimum of four independently evolved lineages. So right now I'm showing you just one of the uh, variant. So. You see over here that for every unevolved strain, there are four of evolved strains. And these kind of studies have been done for all four of them. And if all four of them are showing a consistent behavior, then only we conclude anything from there. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's good enough for me. Yes, please. Um, you know, the usual flux balance analysis um, only makes use of um, the metabolic network. And of course, um, uh, you know, the growth rate, uh, you know, the, the biomass reaction, as well as the um, exchange rates uh, limits that you put on, 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 the, uh, on the rates to calculate the fluxes, yeah. the optimal fluxes. Yeah. Now here, when you're using uh, transcript mass fractions, to constrain that, uh, are you using transcript mass fractions of this particular experiment? Um, yes. I see. For every strain, we have done the RNA sequencing uh, experiment. For every replicate, we have done RNA sequencing experiment in uh, duplicates. And all those data we use to, like, all these uh, uh, constraints have been done separately. For every strain, individual uh, uh, set of constraints. I see. So. Um, uh, so how many um, uh, constraints of this type um, have been actually used which modify the original flux balance analysis fluxes, right? I mean, how many fluxes in practice get modified by these uh, uh, RNA-seq um, data and other data, experimental data? I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Um, it's just that uh, we believe that uh, it's a little bit superior to just constraining the model using uh, uh, metabolite uh, exchange rate data or in general uh, metabolite quantitation. But exactly how many fluxes are, uh, I'm not very clear on that. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about that. Sure. Uh, I have another question. So, yes. uh, just to understand again what's, what's going on here. So I suppose that you got your RNA-seq measurements which you were showing us before and those kind of tell you 
the expression so would, of what i was showing on the previous slide was just one subset of the data that we have so sure. in rna sequencing experiment you get the value of all the genes or most of the genes right and uh, so i guess that and so all of those genes in principle correspond to some edges on this network correct so my simple way of understanding this is that uh, what you've done here is that you've taken the topology of the network as you know it, and you just superimposed the measurements that you have on top of that. Is that correct? So, yes, that's correct. So, so, so basically principle... what we are doing over here is that we are telling the model that this is the uh, value of any enzyme that you can have. Right. Okay. And these are the metabolite levels that you can have to have. Now, with those many number of enzymes, with that level of metabolite, tell me what will be the flux of the cell that will give me the calculated growth rate. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, got it. Um, the other question that I had, which goes back to sort of what Simone was saying, was I suppose that in these kinds of models, one thing that they, correct me if I'm wrong, one thing that they, uh, that they seem to be good at is predicting the outcome of gene knockouts, right? It is, yes. So in Although in case of our work, it was failing quite a lot because unfortunately these models are only good uh, it's as good as much uh, information you feed into these models. Right. Unfortunately, ETS has not been very accurately presented in these models. It was not doing that good a job uh, predicting uh, the outcomes of ETS uh, gene knockouts. I see. Okay. So but that in was, general, yes, it, it can I see. be used. So that for was the my question. That. that maybe one of the things that you could do is you could ask these models to do the in silico <laughs> version of the experiment that we, you did. We started CETA. from there. But it was not doing very. Uh, it was not doing a good job. In fact, the isoprenoid canons that I was talking to you about, these are just not being represented in these models. Okay. So, when it comes to prediction related to, related to ETS, these models are poor, at least till now. Got it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering how these experiments is is that batch culture and how have you always grown your population until saturation? and run out, or do you always keep them in an exponential growth phase? Are they any time limited by the substrate they're having, or are they always an exponential? Got your point, got your point. So in our current lab, we are following both the paradigms, where uh, in one, we are maintaining them in exponential phase all the time, and in another, we are letting them uh, have the entire growth phases all the way from lag to log to stationary. Uh, the, the experiment that I'm talking to you about is where the strains have never seen stationary phase. They have always been maintained in their log phase. These experiments, and again, that was one of the USP in Paulson's lab, which I'm, I'm trying to create in my lab. That's a costly USP, and they have these uh, uh, liquid handler robots. And using that, uh, you can have all the control over the environment. You can tell them that exactly at this OD, passage the cells. Because you would not necessarily expect the same outcome in terms of the adapted not evolution. Really, not really. In fact, you would expect something very, yes, very different, yes, right? Yes. Uh, we have some data that uh, we are trying to rationalize right now, and hopefully sometime soon we'll publish that. So we are actually seeing the differences when you let the strain all the, go all the way to stress any phase versus when you restrict them in the exponential phase. And you're right, because of the mutation profile, the, the entire metabolic uh, profile of the strains in these different growth phases differ, and that has some say on the evolutionary outcome. I have a question. Uh the statement says that uh, it is optimized by a cost effective pathway. So what do we mean? What is cost here? How do we do that's where I'm going to leave you with just a promise that I'll come back to it uh, tomorrow. So uh, at Weizmann Institute, uh, uh, one of my I'm, I'm like a fan of this uh, scientist, uh, Ron Milo. He does all these sort of uh, quantitation and I'm going to talk about one of his work tomorrow to talk about the differences between EMP pathway and ED pathway in terms of their proteomic cost, and how that becomes very, very critical in uh, uh, determining the physiological outcomes of these trails and also rationalizing the data, the actual data, experimental data. So I'll, I'll come to that for sure. I have a question. So uh, the metabolic network you're talking about here, does it also have inputs from a signaling network, protein-protein interactions, and the genetic alterations that you have made? in your system. So are those genetic inputs also a part of this network or it's entirely metabolites and the metabolic parts of the cell only integrated into the network? So- Short answer is yes. So we do the input. So basically um, that's what uh, um, he was also saying that 
these models allow you to do all sorts of these things. So you can actually say that, okay, uh, this is the model of E. coli, but the strain that I'm dealing with does not have this enzyme. So now use that as one of the factor and tell me the outcome. So I, that's been done, yeah. I see. So uh, just to refine my question, uh, does your input have anything like, you know, a knockout of a particular gene and then you get to see that the glycolysis is up or down and hence the growth. So those inputs are I there. I will again talk about that a little bit in detail mm -hmm. when I'm gonna talk about uh, Stuti's work. Uh, there actually I'll show you that how those knockouts play a very critical role in uh, determining the outcomes. Okay, uh, so uh, just a follow-up question on that is because the time scales are different. So if you think about genetic uh, alterations, time scales as in signaling network, metabolic networks and transcription translation per se. So I'm a bit confused, how do we integrate different time scales, networks of different time scales into a model? So if you think about transcription and translation to happen in probably, you know, uh, around in hours or so, and metabolic events happening in minutes and, uh, you know, signaling like phosphorylation happening in seconds. So how do we integrate it, everything in one network? So do I, we need to uh, consider anything? Yeah, so I don't think over here that uh, temporal uh, uh, parameters have been uh, factored in. Over here, what you're seeing is that um, these are very static uh, uh, interpretations where you know what are the uh, potential expression levels of those genes, or actually not potential, you know the expression level of those genes, and you know the metabolite abundance, and then you're simply saying that based on these things, tell me what will be the flux value through different, different reactions to give me the growth rate that we are observing experimentally. So I don't think yes. the inputs that you are talking about is being uh, used in a temporal manner over here. Okay, okay, got it. <laughs> yep. Sure, so let me do one thing. I'll probably keep that on, in this board because uh, I'm gonna talk about those things all the time. So what I'm gonna, f no, what I am talking about and what I'll continue talking about is one type of uh, uh, electron transport system that is aerobic electron transport system in that electrons are primarily entering through. So NADH is the primary donor of the electron. And then you have these, uh, um, this is what I'm calling as NDH1. This is NADH dehydrogenase, NADH dehydrogenase type one. The job of this is to oxidize NADH to NAD plus, and uh, the energy that they get uh, because of this oxidation is used for pumping out proton. Now, just to make sense of things, these, this, this is cytosolic part. This is the And this is the periplasm site. Okay. Now the electron that uh, comes from here, and uh, there are these uh, uh, mobile carrier uh, molecules that isoprenoid canons that I'm talking about. Just for the sake of simplicity of this scheme over here, I'm right now uh, not presenting that. But the electron uh, from here to the next uh, enzyme complex that I'm gonna talk about, moves through those mobile electron carriers. So then you have, something called uh, cytochrome oxidases. Now, this so electron, do, do, the, do the electrons go from the first one to the, oh yeah, okay. okay. And uh, you have these uh, quinone molecules sitting over here. Um, in different systems, these carrier molecules, carriers can also be different. Like uh, 
in a uh, micro mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, there is another. Just to ignore these uh, species terms and all, I'm just giving you this information that there are some bacterial species that uses uh, other carrier electron carrier molecules also. This this site from C that also function as mobile electron carrier. But generally, in uh, the bacteria that I'm going to talk, that I'm talking about, Escherichia coli, that uses these quinone molecules. Now, over here, you have oxygen getting reduced to water because of the electron. And then again, in response to that, you have pumping of proton. Right, OK, so this, this has clarified it for me. I, I didn't understand before. Um, but now my question is, there's these four types of the process. Yeah. And so what's just give me 30 more seconds. Sure. So I talked about NDH1. There is another one. NDH2. This does the same job. NAD plus. But it does not pump out proton. Okay, so there is a trade off between uh, their membranes space occupancy versus their ability to generate proton motive force. And then uh, there are these oxidases are of different types. There is BO3 oxidase and BD oxidase. Okay, yeah, you can continue with your question. Okay, and so these four, there's these four variations of. I've been. Uh, Done yeah. playing around with the what or which uh, NADs have this is present and which cytochrome oxidase is present. So if you have a type one and BO3 oxidase, then this will pump two electron, sorry, two proton, and this will pump two proton, so total four proton per electron. Mm. But if you delete this one and use this one, then there won't be any proton being pumped from here. And if you use BO3, then that will result in two proton per electron. So why uh, is is it not best? Uh, what what's the benefit of pumping more electrons into the mitochondria compared to less? Is is it not the case of? Sorry, come again. Um, I don't know what I'm trying. To... Are you trying to say that why they don't always have the highest proton motive force generating route? Yeah, is there some optimal level, some trade-off with the amount of protons released? Yeah, so the there is uh, quite a bit of uh, trade-off. And again, I'm going to talk about that trade-off today itself. Uh, that is especially in the context of this uh, membrane space occupancy. Um, unlike uh, the, the simplistic representation in majority of the textbook, uh, cellular milieu is highly crowded. That includes uh, membrane uh, space also. Within, within that crowded space, they have to allocate resources very wisely, very carefully so that they can get maximum output in that given condition. So, and it's, it's something which, is, which has been done experimentally also, that when these cells live in a condition which is uh, very rich in nutrients, let's say uh, glucose is present in abundance, then what they want to do is to have more and more of glucose import system. So the importers that will allow them to have more and more glucose coming inside the cell. For, so for that, they have to create a space for that. And the, one of the way by which they can create more space for having those glucose importer is by getting rid of these uh, bulky enzyme complexes. Okay, now what is happening over there is that they have uh, more and more of glucose importers so they can take in more glucose. They can get their ATP supply met through glycolysis and fermentation and they can uh, live happily. And uh, the uh, fermentative pathways and glycolytic pathway are more faster in terms of ATP output. In fact, uh, that's the reason uh, uh, it's known in biology that cancer cells rely more on uh, uh, glycolytic uh, supply of ATP, something known as Warburg effect. Just to clarify, so one sure. of the things you're experimenting with is checking if, if you remove one of these types, it still works. Um, and so I, I wonder if uh, it's possible that the reason that there are these multiple types is kind of a redundancy in the system in case of mutation knocks one of them out by accident. Is, is that a reasonable hypothesis or not really? I don't think I got your question clearly. So there's these, these multiple variations of how this process can work. And if I understand correctly, you're trying to uh, remove one of the variations or two to see if um, the cell still functions. And so I wonder if it's a reasonable hypothesis that the reason there's multiple types of the process is redundancy 
so if, if there's a disadvantageous mutation, it doesn't uh, completely destroy the... Oh, I see. Yes, 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 yes. That's correct. That's correct. So um, unlike us, these microbes are directly exposed to their environment. And they live in a very varied environment, uh, environmental types. They have to deal with the multiple different kinds of stresses. So depending upon the immediate uh, ambient environment, they have to tailor their uh, growth physiology. They have to tailor their metabolic network. So having these, uh, again, I, uh, I try to refrain from calling them redundant. Alternate enzyme complexes allow them to um, adapt to that given condition. And that's why these things exist. And one of the uh, one of the outcome is also from the AMR point of view that if you start targeting one of these enzyme complexes, then the compensatory one can actually allow them to survive. That's some question. Yeah, so you just mentioned that uh, when uh, the microbe is made to grow in a glucose-rich environment, it will tend to produce or have more transporters in the membrane, but then there's a limitation on the space available. So in that can only happen if these complexes are removed. That means the ATP production is going to get affected. And parallelly, a fermentation the mechanism, pathway... The mechanism of ATP production changes, not exactly the ATP uh, production... Uh, via rate. ETC. Let us yes, say, yes. Is affected, but yeah. that is compensated. Anyways, ETC does not result in... Uh, ETC does not produce ATP. ETC only produce PMF, proton motive force. Okay, so it's the ATP synthase that uses that proton motive force. Anyways, I'm going okay, into yes. the biological jargon. So, Sorry, but then for that. the ATP to get produced, this still has to be there. Yeah. Yes. So the ATP molecules produced via ETC and then through ATPase mm -hmm. gets affected, but that is compensated by the fermentative pathways Correct. coming into pictures. Yeah. So what we study is there's a switch from respiratory to, to fermentative. Form. This is the reason that yes. it switches, it makes that switch yes. in a glucose rich environment. Correct. This is the only reason that there is a switch. In no, biology, if you ask me to say only, I will refrain, but this is the known reason. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We, we don't make that kind of definitive statements because there's always uh, some scope of uh, uh, something uh, unknown happening. Okay. So that's that. And uh, um, so. There is the, and that's why there is this concept emerging, and I was trying to uh, stay away from those jargons. There is something called membrane economy theory. That membrane economy theory is exactly about this, that uh, you have to optimize the membrane space uh, in a way that you get best in that given environment. And uh, the acetate over, overflow metabolism, that's again related to this only. Okay. So that, should I move to? So this is exactly where I was coming. That uh, then we tried it. Uh, then we try to understand how these variants are being able to uh, achieve the similar growth rate. Um, of course, uh, ATP is very critical for them to maintain that growth rate. So we looked into that out of the total ATP they are being able to produce, or the total ATP that they require, what co what is contributing to to that ATP supply? So. Um, this is a very simple representation of uh, central carbon metabolism. And what I'm trying to highlight over here is that there are multiple different places for ATP supply, uh, ATP production. Of course, ATP synthase is the one which is responsible for ATP production through oxidative phosphorylation. You have acetate kinase in mix, mixed acid fermentation that can also produce uh, ATP, fractional co synthase, and then phosphoglycerate kinase. These are also uh, known to be uh, responsible for ATP production. And what you see over here is that depending upon what is their proton motive force generation uh, capability? They are playing around with the, the uh, localization of ATP production reactions. So ETS4H, which is the most efficient uh, proton motive force generation generating strain, they are relying more on oxidative phosphorylation for the production of ATP and less on the glycolytic or fermentative. Whereas ETS1H, that has the uh, least proton motive force generation ability. They are relying more on uh, glycolytic and fermentative uh, uh, supply of ATP compared to the oxidative phosphorylation. So this is how they are being able to uh, play around their metabolic network and being able to achieve similar kind of growth output. 
Now, the question that we are now uh, trying to probe in the lab and which we are very interested in trying to figure out is that uh, if uh, these ETS, uh, alternate ECS are equivalent, then why do these, uh, I should have put this redundancy in quotes, why, actually I put it in italics. So why does this uh, redundancy exist? So this is what we are trying to figure out. Of course, uh, one of the reasons is that <clears throat> what you uh, saw till now is all about uh, their growth behavior in the presence of glucose as the carbon source. The moment you change uh, glucose to some other carbon source, things will change drastically. At the same time, there are several other uh, uh, implications of the proton motive force that's generated. It's not only about uh, production of ATP. The proton motive force that's generated uh, in the periplasmic space, that's also important for the uh, metabolic, uh, metabolite import, export, so there are these uh, PMF or PMF dependent uh, exporters, importers, and then it is very critical for the movement of uh, flagella. So flagella are the apparatus that allow these uh, these uh, bacterial cells to move from places to places, and the movement of or the rotation of that flagella is dependent on proton motive force. So that's this proton motive force has wider implication on cellular physiology than just generation of ATP. So we are trying to uh, study this more. And what we are trying to do is uh, performing these laboratory evolution in a physiologically more uh, relevant condition. In fact, uh, hopefully by the end of this year itself, uh, Stuti will be able to set up a, a model where instead of doing evolution in tubes on the flask, we are trying to go all the way to doing the evolution inside the actual cells. So those things are coming along. Now, um, most time do I have? 18 minutes. So since we have been talking about electron transport system and uh, electron transport system is nothing but the flow of electron, let's very quickly talk about the journey of an electron. So these are the uh, question that I used to solve uh, in my high schools and I believe uh, most of you have done it. So you have these half cells and uh, if someone asks you to write the, um, reaction that will allow you to have a spontaneity in this uh, reaction, uh, you will be very easily able to uh, write uh, uh, this reaction using uh, these half cells. And the idea is very simple that if you have a, a cell potential of uh, cell potential which is positive, then your Gibbs free energy is negative and the reactions become spontaneous. Now, what it says that if you have a combination of reduction potential favored redox uh, complexes, then that will release free energy. And then you can use that free energy for uh, various applications. And even before we learned about this and tried exploiting it for generating all cells and everything, nature, of course, learned and exploited this concept uh, way, way, way before us. And uh, this concept is actually something which is very relevant to electron transport system. So in electron transport system, nature has very nicely evolved complexes that differ in their redox potential and Along the flow of electron, the reduction potential increases. So the, uh, the one which takes electron from NADH has lesser reduction potential than the one that is sitting at the end to finally take the electron and give it to oxygen. So this favored flow of electron is the one that allows them to have a release of free energy. And that free energy is what is being used for pumping out proton. And then of course that proton is being used for um, generating ATP. The reason this uh, route uh, or this flow of electron from NADS to oxygen has been broken in uh, parts is this, that if you directly um, reduce NADH, uh, take electron from NADS and transfer it to oxygen, you'll have a release of about uh, 218 uh, uh, kilojoule of energy. And this will be like released in one, uh, what is it, bulk. And you will not be able to use it for uh, uh, utilizable purposes or physiologically relevant purposes. So electron transport chain actually breaks it down so that you have this energy coming in uh, smaller uh, uh, pockets. And then that is used for pumping on proton. And this is from one of the uh, famous biochemistry textbook where they say that when you break it down, uh, you get uh, smaller pieces of energy, which is uh, important for the pumping out of proton. Now, what is very interesting over here is that although this entire process can be made spontaneous, by having these uh, different uh, enzyme complexes over here, the electron within one complex can also not, like within uh, this complex one, it cannot just move from here to here 
uh, independently. There has to be some sort of wiring mechanism over there. And that wiring mechanism is provided by, and the reason uh, that wiring mechanism uh, should exist is uh, uh, from this uh, study where uh, uh, people have looked at uh, uh, what will be the distance an electron can hop from, uh, what, what is the distance an electron can freely hop in physiological condition? So this is a compilation of data from various different uh, uh, redox active enzymes where they have looked at uh, uh, what is the distance between the redox centers in those enzymes. So they have looked at it and what they have observed that uh, in majority of the cases, the distance is less than 15 angstrom. So which is saying that this 15 angstrom is the roughly the distance an electron can hop in physiological condition freely. To elaborate a little bit more on this uh, concept, I'll be talking about complex one, that is the, the, the bigger uh, NADH dehydrogenase that I have mentioned over there, NDH1. What you see over here is that this particular is a, uh, and I'm, I'm like really fascinated by this enzyme complex. This is like amazing enzyme complex, giant enzyme complex. It consists of some 14 subunits in bacteria and uh, things get crazier in the mitochondria. In mitochondria, they have some 44 subunits. Although the 14 subunit that's there in bacteria is conserved in mitochondria, there are some accessories, uh, accessory subunits present in the mitochondria. Um, and uh, the, there are these two modules. This module is for uh, oxidation of NADH. And this is the module that is for uh, pumping the proton out. And there is this uh, intermediary module that is for the reduction of uh, quinones. Now, complex one actually couples these two processes of NADH uh, oxidation and uh, uh, proton pumping together. So again, a little bit of uh, very quickly about the uh, potential uh, evolution of these complex complexes. So it's like highly unlikely. And in the lab currently, uh, one of my group members is trying to figure out uh, how this uh, giant enzyme complex has evolved. So what he's doing is that he's taken some 40,000 uh, uh, genomes that's available, bacterial genomes that's available, and he's trying to figure out what's the distribution of various subunits of these uh, enzyme complexes are to try to make sense that when and how different subunits of this enzyme complex came together and resulted in formation of this beautiful enzyme complex. But uh, right now what I'm just trying to tell you is that these, this uh, enzyme complex has actually evolved from some pre-existing uh, enzymes, which, were, which are the actually the ancestral homologs of it. And if you look at uh, their structure, it looks so beautifully similar. So they have, these are different uh, enzymes. Uh, this is uh, nickel iron hydrogenases. These are MRP antiporter. Uh, and these have uh, come together in some uh, bacterial strain to result in formation of this assembled entire complex one. So that, and uh, I was talking about uh, this uh, flow of electron within one enzyme complex. And this can also happen uh, within a distance of about 15 angstrom. And in order to achieve that, what uh, these enzyme complexes have done is that they have decorated these uh, different uh, you know, iron sulfur clusters at a very regular interval. So in complex one, the, the soluble uh, arm of it, basically this arm over here, you have uh, this uh, chain of uh, iron sulfur cluster present. And if you look at uh, the distances they have, uh, in the bracket, you have the distance of this the S to S distance. So this is almost everywhere uh, less than 15 angstrom. So this actually allowed them to flow or move the electron from one end to another end. So N3 is the one where electron uh, enters first. So over here, uh, flavin mononucleotide sits and flavin mononucleotide takes electron from NADH and it transferred to N3. From N3, it goes to N1B, N5, like, like this. Uh, what you can notice over here is that between N5 and N7, there is a distance of over 21 angstrom which is larger than the uh, favored uh, distance for electron hopping. And that's why N7 is believed to be the evolutionary relic. It's not very functional. Uh, you see some anomaly over here also that is uh, 19 angstrom. But then uh, I'll talk about a little bit uh, how N1 becomes very, very relevant for the functioning of this complex one. Complex one. Because uh, over here, I mentioned to you that FMN is sitting. And FMN and N1A distance is less than 15 angstrom. The electron actually does not move between N1A, N1A and N3, rather from flavin to N1A. So just to quickly uh, wrap this part up, uh, a chain of about seven iron sulfur cluster uh, comprises, uh, comprises the root. And depending upon if you take a different bacterial species, the number of these iron sulfur clusters may change. But this is the overall arrangement of these iron sulfur clusters. Um, 
N3, I mentioned that is starting point of an extended electron transport chain with quinon. So after N2, you have those isoprenoid quinones that take electron from here and get reduced. Um, N1A, this one is uh, very important because this plays a critical role in the regulation of uh, uh, ROS generation. I and mean, this is a little bit of uh, biology jargon. Uh, so ROS is nothing but reactive oxygen species. These are uh, uh, reactive radicals, which are in general present in this, uh, produced in the cells. And when you have a higher production of these reactive radicals that can be uh, lethal to the cells. So the cells try to uh, produce these ROS in a threshold concentration only. So these are the mechanism by which they regulate the production of that. So now what is very interesting is that uh, uh, in the previous slide I showed you that from in NADH to oxygen, there's this uh, trend of increasing reduction potential. But what is interesting is that within this uh, uh, chain, the trend of uh, redox potential is quite uh, zigzag. So different iron sulfur clusters in a very alternate manner have higher and lower reduction potential. And that like uh, makes it a bit uh, complicated to understand how electrons flow within that chain of iron sulfur clusters. Now people have tried explaining it, but then uh, till now it is just, uh, uh, there has been no experimental validation for it. There is this like beautiful theories um, telling why, what this happens. In fact, uh, uh, there is one understanding that uh, uh, reduction potential that's been shown over here that gets influenced by the protein dielectrics. And uh, if you look into the compensation uh, due to those protein dielectric, that brings down the reduction potential. And actually this entire chain become isopotential. And in that isopotential chain, then uh, this one over here, this iron sulfur cluster, actually becomes the anchor and it drives electron. It creates the pull force for the electron to move from NADH to the end, that is the quinon. Um, this is a crowded slide. Um, um, just to tell you about uh, the importance of this N1A. So from FMN, that is the flavin mononucleotide, one of the electron goes to N3. And at one, point, at one time, this chain can only allow the movement of one electron. So the other electron has to be kept safely. Otherwise, that will result in the all cellular havoc and that will create uh, cross and everything. So that one electron potentially goes to N1A. And then this N1A uh, plays two roles and two potential roles. One is to hold on to that electron till this electron has been transferred to quinone and then this electron goes back again to this chain. The other is exactly uh, what's been depicted over here is that uh, um, there is this uh, site where NADH binds and if NADH binds over here, then it will be binding there tightly. Whereas if it binds over here, then it will be loosely bound. And this one is N1A and I guess this is not very clear to you. This is OX, which is oxidized. So oxidized N1A. So when NADH comes over here, uh, this remains oxidized. But what happens is that there is a flip in this carbonyl bond. And this remains flipped when this uh, flavin mononucleotide is reduced. Now, if this quinone is available over here for the reduction, then what will happen is that this reduced FMN will again get oxidized and this will this uh, carbonyl will flip back to its original position, pushing that, uh, this NAD uh, plus from tight bound state to loose bound state. And then this NAD, NAD plus will be removed from the complex and the next NADH will come and this chain will take place. But what if that quinone is not available for the, uh, there for taking this electron? In that case, that this NAD plus should not be thrown out. This NAD plus has to be retained over there. Otherwise, before the flow of that electron, FMN will be reduced by next uh, incoming NADH. And as mentioned over here, that fully reduced flavin is the major source of ROS over here. So cells want that till uh, this particular electron has been given to quinone, this NAD should remain in the complex. And for that, what happens is that uh, when quinone is blocked, quinone is not able to take the electron from here. Uh, this N1A takes the electron and it gets reduced. And then this reduced one prohibits the flipping of this carbonyl bond. So this is a mechanism. This is a probable mechanism through which uh, N1A allows the cells to mitigate uh, the detrimental leak of electron from this enzyme complex. So that's that. And um, I have over five minutes. So in those five minutes, I'll tell why bacteria are crazy. And this is also to talk about a few of the concepts that I promised that I'll be talking about, uh, talking about in today's lecture. 
Um, coming from a, a bacteriologist, uh, uh, mouth is like really uh, not good to say bacteria is crazy. We love them. Uh, but the thing is that uh, I spent a lot of time talking about this NDH1 and how NDH1 is a beautiful enzyme complex and how this is important for the physiology of uh, microbes. The reason I'm calling them crazy is that there is this alternate energy dehydrogenase that is NDH2. And NDH2 is the one that is preferred by these microbes, uh, especially Escherichia coli. They prefer to use this smaller one than this larger one. And uh, if you look at the distribution of this uh, uh, type 2 energy dehydrogenase, it's widely distributed. Although it is not present in mammalian uh, mitochondria, it is present in uh, several uh, eukaryotes, uh, eukaryotes also. Um, and that actually makes it very interesting. Because this NDS2 is not present in uh, our mitochondria, it becomes a natural target. And I mentioned that NDS2 is very important for bacterial uh, electron transport system. It becomes very, very natural target for development of antimicrobials. Because that's, that is exactly what you want in an antimicrobial. That it should be there in the microbe, but it should not be important for us. And that's what this NDS2 is about. So uh, the idea is if you block NDS2, you will probably be able to get a, a better antimicrobial. So what we wanted to see is, can these cells survive the loss of NDS2? So um, I've already talked about uh, the size variability and all that's been talked about here. Um, I have talked about uh, uh, the higher utilization of NDS2 in uh, aerobic condition. And uh, yeah, something interesting over here that will actually help us uh, contextualize the result a little bit is that uh, between this NDH1 and NDS2, NDS2 has higher turnover rate. So they can uh, oxidize uh, NADH more efficiently than the type 1 of uh, NADH has. So I can probably skip this, but then uh, this is simply talking about uh, what are the importance of this uh, NDH1 and NDH2. Uh, the idea is very simple that uh, cells produce these reducing metabolite NADH during glycolysis and TCA cycle. And these reducing metabolites have to be oxidized in order to maintain the redox homeostasis of the cell. And one of the major uh, site for the oxidation of this NADH is actually the entry point of electron transport chain by NDH1 and NDH2. And NDH2 becomes very critical in the man maintenance of this redox homeostasis because I mentioned that NDH2 has higher turnover for the oxidation of the NADH. So with all that in mind, um, we created this uh, type 2 NADH dehydrogenase uh, deleted strain that is that we are labeling as delta NDH. We evolved them. And as mentioned uh, uh, earlier also, we always do this with a minimum of uh, four uh, replicates. And uh, this GMOS is nothing but uh, what I've been asked. Uh, uh, this is the wild type which has been evolved in the similar condition. We call that GMOS because it's a glucose minimal media optimized strain. So this is, a, this is nothing but wild type which has been evolved. And uh, these are the Type two NADH, uh, type two NADH dehydrogenase knockout strain evolved in the similar media type. What you see over here is that uh, when you delete uh, uh, type two NADH dehydrogenase, there is a drop in the growth rate. So wild type is this guy over here, and this is the delta NDH. So there is a drop in the growth rate. But after evolution, um, both of course wild type improves its growth rate. So from here it goes to here, and similarly the type two NADH dehydrogenase uh, deleted strains also after evolution, improve their growth rate and becomes a, uh, or attains a higher growth rate. Of course, we have tried looking into what is enabling it and uh, what we observed, and this is uh, going back to what you were asking. So the mutational basis for it, what we observed that uh, out of the four replicate that we evolved over here, three of them had mutation in this gene called succinate dehydrogenase, uh, the succinate A of succinate dehydrogenase. And uh, we tried to make sense of, uh, we of course first wanted to see whether that mutation is uh, gain of function mutation or loss of function mutation. For my non-biologist audience, we are simply trying to figure out whether the mutation is improving the functionality of that enzyme or decreasing the functionality of that enzyme. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, but we were quite lucky in this uh, particular case that one of the mutation was actually uh, introducing a premature termination codon. So again, for my non-biologist audience, um, there's this ORF where uh, uh, there's a start codon and there's a stop codon, and this dictates uh, the entire uh, production of that particular uh, mRNA, or actually the protein. 
Now, if you move that stop cord on from its uh, cognate position to somewhere uh, in between, then what will happen is that your peptide will get fragmented. And uh, in most likely condition, in major, uh, your peptide will not be functional. So in this case, actually one of the replicate acquired that premature termination codon, and that's why the peptide got fragmented. And that's what uh, um, gave us this confidence that this is a loss of function mutation. So basically this uh, enzyme complex is not functioning to the level at it, as it functions in the wild type stream. And we have done some bit of structural simulation about the other mutations also. And those other mutations also seem to be loss of function mutation in nature. And uh, uh, we have done this uh, enzymatic validation for that. And we have looked into the activity of succinic dehydrogenase in the wall strains. And we do see the strains that have this mutation. They have a lower uh, succinic dehydrogenase activity. Um, so again, this is the uh, RNA sequencing uh, based data just to look into the expression of, because these were type two NADS dehydrogenase uh, knocked out strain. We wanted to see whether the type one NADS dehydrogenase is getting uh, upregulated or not. Uh, as with the uh, NDH, uh, sorry, ETS3, uh, I don't uh, uh, expect you to remember from the previous slide, but one of the variant was showing that, uh, uh, actually ETS4H, where it was uh, shown that the upregulation was not happening in the uh, unevolved strain. It was happening only after evolution. Something like that was happening, happening over here also. That the unevolved strain was not showing the upregulation of alternate enzyme complex. It was only after evolution that enzyme complex increased the uh, expression. And uh, we looked into uh, the metabolic network or the flux of this particular thing, the very same way as we did for uh, the previous study. And uh, what we observed over here very nicely, and I guess uh, during the uh, one of the session, uh, um, Suthi will be talking about Asher. Uh, that's one of the way by which you can, like in a very crude way, use genome scale model to look into the immediate outcome of some gene knockouts and that kind of thing. So what was happening over here is that, this mutation, this succinic dehydrogenase mutation was actually allowing them to selectively silence some of the reaction that were responsible for the production of NADH. Now that is very important for these strains because now these strains do not have the high turnover NADH dehydrogenase. They are dependent on the slower one. So they will not be as efficient in maintaining the redox homeostasis as, uh, um, as the one that have this uh, type 2 NADH dehydrogenase. So what they are trying to do is that they are trying to reduce the load of NADH in the cells. So we believe that's how these strains are uh, evolving. And I'll probably skip, I'll try finding time for it uh, in tomorrow's talk. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'll try. So today we have just looked into the uh, intro of ETS and a theory for the origin of ETS and ETS diversity in prokaryotes. Uh, some of the implications of uh, those redox centers and how that creates that wiring mechanism within the complex for the flow of electron. And with that, uh, thank you. And I'm open to take more questions. Time for a couple of questions, and then I suggest that we could continue over the coffee break. Um, any question, Alberto? You said about the ATP synthase that uh, can uh, Perform in the opposite direction yes. in case. So, the, the general, my general understanding is that usually you have a concentration of, of protons outside the membrane, and that concentration is used to produce ATP. Mm -hmm. Whereas, what you're saying is the opposite is true when, when, whenever there is a concentration of proton inside instead. But is this, is this frequent? Are there organisms in which this is the dominant factor? Yeah. So, that's what I was trying to tell you that majority of the anaerobes does that. Majority of the anaerobic bacteria does that. They uses these enzyme complexes for actually maintaining that PMF, for pumping proton out. So it's totally dependent on the proton motive force in the periplasmic space. If the proton motive force is high, then uh, these complexes uh, take proton in and result in formation of uh, uh, ATP molecule. But if the proton motive force is uh, uh, getting low or getting uh, disseminated because again, I mentioned that uh, there are lots of cellular processes which are all dependent on proton motive force, like import system, export system. Um, majority of the efflux pump actually uses these proton motive force. Flexler movement is dependent on these proton motive force. So if those things are consuming that proton motive force and ETS is not there to maintain that proton motive force, then the direction of these uh, pumps are reversed 
for actually maintaining that proton molecule. So it's possible that uh, an environmental condition triggers the switch yes. in the same organism. Yes. It's it's uh, actually documented. There are evidences, uh, known evidences for that. Okay, I think that counts as two questions. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. We reconvene at half past. Um, what is it? Half past eleven. Yep. With Massimiliano Esposito.